may be best known for Oliver Twist, Nicholas Nickleby, Great Expectations, David Copperfield, and of course, A Christmas Carol. But Charles Dickens was a prolific writer. Over 40 years, he wrote essays, plays, sketches, stories, and serialized novels, somewhat optimistic works, despite a frequent focus on childhood poverty. I hadn't a shoe to my foot. <laughs> As to a stocking, I didn't know such a thing by name. I passed the day in a ditch and the night in a pigsty. That's the way I spent my tenth birthday. Not that a ditch was new to me, for I was born in a ditch. Welcome again to Trinity Rep Radio Theater here on WRNI, an exploration of dramatic literature performed by members of the Trinity Repertory Company. I'm Bob C., joined by Trinity Rep Artistic Director Kurt Columbus. And in the next hour, we'll hear seven readings from some of the lesser-known works of Charles Dickens. And, Kurt, Dickens is so much more than just A Christmas Carol. Oh, yes, Bob. I mean, the thing that is so remarkable about Charles Dickens is that as a writer, he is so incredibly theatrical and simultaneously funny and dramatic. Uh, it, it provides so much opportunity for us uh, in terms of performance. And most people tend to know him for uh, a very narrow band of his work in this country, and, and he's really relevant to us today. He has something to say to us, so we thought we'd bring you some of the work uh, that you might not normally hear. And there's so much material, we're actually doing two of these programs. That's right, that's right. Um, today's material is going to be the non-holiday themed work, <laughs> and then for the holidays, we're going to do a holiday themed program. Uh, it's uh, one of my favorite quotes. I'm just going to interject here is uh, from Oscar Wilde, actually talking about um, uh, Dickens' book, *The Old Curiosity Shop*. And he said, "One must have a heart of stone to read the death of Little Nell without laughing." <laughs> and I think that that really exemplifies the way in which Dickens is both simultaneously really funny and truly tragic. Well, tell us about what we're going to hear first. Well, um, I'm actually going to pass it over to Janice Duclos, who's been putting these programs together for us. Janice? Well, there's nothing Charles Dickens likes more than to skewer the policymakers. And the first piece that we have, his target is education. So now we're going to hear Nothing But Facts from Hard Times, performed by Janice Duclos, Mauro Hantman, and William Domkaler. The scene was a plain, bare, monotonous vault of a schoolroom. Now, what I want is facts. Teach these boys and girls nothing but facts. Facts alone are wanted in life. Plant nothing else and root out everything else. You can only form the minds of reasoning animals upon facts. Nothing else will ever be of any service to them. This is the principle on which I bring up my own children, and this is the principle on which I bring up these children. Stick to facts, sir. The speaker, Thomas Gradgrind and the schoolmaster and the third grown person present swept with their eyes the inclined plane of little vessels then and there arranged in order, ready to have imperial gallons of facts poured into them until they were full to the brim. Thomas Gradgrind, a man of realities, a man of facts and calculations, a man who proceeds upon the principle that two and two are four and nothing over, and who is not to be talked into allowing for anything over. He seemed a galvanizing apparatus, charged with a grim mechanical substitute for the tender young imaginations that were to be stormed away. Girl number 20, said Mr. Gradgrind, squarely pointing with his square forefinger. I don't know that girl. Who is that girl? Sissy Jupe, sir, explained number 20, blushing, standing up, and curtsying. Sissy is not a name. Don't call yourself Sissy. Call yourself Cecilia. "'It's father as calls me sissy, sir,' returned the young girl in a trembling voice and with another curtsy. "'Then he has no business to do it. Tell him he mustn't. Cecilia Jupe, let me see. What is your father?' "'He belongs to the horse-riding, if you please, sir.' Mr. Gradgrind frowned and waved off the objectionable calling with his hand. "'We don't want to know anything about that here. You mustn't tell us about that here. Your father breaks horses, don't he?' If you please, sir, when they can get any to break, they do break horses in the ring, sir. You mustn't tell us about the ring here. Very well, then. Describe your father as a horse-breaker. He doctors sick horses, I dare say. Oh, yes, sir. Very well, then. He is a veterinary surgeon, a farrier, and a horse-breaker. Give me your definition of a horse. 
Sissy Jupe thrown into the greatest alarm by this demand. Girl number twenty unable to define a horse. Girl number twenty possessed of no facts in reference to one of the commonest of animals. Some boy's definition of a horse. Bitzer, yours. The square finger moving here and there lighted suddenly on Bitzer. Perhaps because he chanced to sit in the same ray of sunlight, which, darting in at one of the bare windows of the intensely whitewashed room, irradiated Sissy. But whereas the girl was so dark-eyed and dark-haired that she seemed to receive a deeper and more lustrous color from the sun when it shone upon her, the boy was so light-eyed and light-haired that the self-same rays appeared to draw out of him what little color he had ever possessed. His cold eyes would hardly have been eyes. But for the short ends of lashes, which, by bringing them into immediate contrast with something paler than themselves, expressed their form, his short cropped hair might have been a mere continuation of the sandy freckles on his forehead and face. His skin was so unwholesomely deficient in the natural tinge that he looked as though, if he were cut, he would bleed white. Bitzer, your definition of a horse. Quadruped, gramnivorous. Forty teeth, namely twenty-four grinders, four eye teeth, and twelve incisive, sheds coat in the spring. In marshy countries, sheds hoofs too, hoofs hard but requiring to be shod with iron. Age known by marks in mouth. Thus and much more, Bitzer. Now, girl number twenty, you know what a horse is. She curtsied again and would have blushed deeper. If she could have blushed deeper than she had blushed all this time, Bitzer, after rapidly blinking at Thomas Gradgrind with both eyes at once, and so catching the light upon his quivering ends of lashes that they looked like the antennae of busy insects, put his knuckles to his freckled forehead and sat down again. The third gentleman now stepped forth. A mighty man at cutting and drying he was, a government officer, in his way and in most other people's too, a professed pugilist. Always in training, always with a system for, to force down the general throat like a bolus, always to be heard of at the bar of his little public office, ready to fight all England. He was certain to knock the wind out of common sense and render that unlucky adversary deaf to the call of time. Very well," said this gentleman, briskly smiling and folding his arms. "That's a horse. Now let me ask you, boys and girls." Would you paper a room with representations of horses? After a pause, one half of the children cried in chorus, "Yes, sir." Upon which the other half, seeing in the gentleman's face that yes was wrong, cried out in chorus, "No, sir," as the custom is in these examinations. Of course, no. Why wouldn't you? A pause. One corpulent, slow boy with a wheezy manner of breathing ventured the answer, because he wouldn't paper a room at all, but would paint it. Well, you must paper it," said the gentleman rather warmly. "You must paper it, whether you like it or not. Don't tell us you wouldn't paper it. What do you mean, boy?" "I'll explain to you then," said the gentleman after another and a dismal pause. Why you wouldn't paper a room with representations of horses? Do you ever see horses walking up and down the sides of rooms in reality? In fact, do you? Yes, sir. From one half. No, sir. From the other. Of course, no," said the gentleman with an indignant look at the wrong half. Why then, you are not to see anywhere what you don't see in fact. You are not to have anywhere what you don't have. In fact, what is called taste is only another name for fact. Thomas Gradgrind nodded his approbation. This is a new principle, a discovery, a great discovery. Now、uh, I'll try you again. Suppose you were going to carpet a room. Would you use a carpet having a representation of flowers upon it? There being a general conviction by this time that no sir was always the right answer to this gentleman, the chorus of no was very strong. Only a few feeble stragglers said yes. Among them, Sissy Jupe. Girl number twenty, said the gentleman, smiling in the calm strength of knowledge. Sissy blushed and stood up. So, you would carpet your room or your husband's room if you were a grown woman and had a husband.
with representations of flowers, would you? Why would you? If you please, sir, I am very fond of flowers. And is that why you would put tables and chairs upon them, and have people walking over them with heavy boots? It wouldn't hurt them, sir. They wouldn't crush and wither, if you please, sir. They would be the pictures of what was very pretty and pleasant, and I would fancy. Aye, aye, aye! But you mustn't fancy," cried the gentleman, quite elated by coming so happily to this point. "That's it. You are never to fancy. You are not, Cecilia Jupe, to do anything of that kind. Fact, 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 fact." Fact, fact. You are to be in all things regulated and governed by fact. We hope to have, before long, a board of fact composed of commissioners of fact who will force the people to be a people of fact and of nothing but fact. You must discard the word fancy altogether. You have nothing to do with it. You are not to have in any object. Of use or ornament, what would be a contradiction in fact? You don't walk upon flowers. In fact, you cannot be allowed to walk upon flowers in carpets. You don't find that foreign birds and butterflies come and perch upon your crockery. You cannot be permitted to paint foreign birds and butterflies upon your crockery. You never meet with quadrupeds going up and down walls. You must not have quadrupeds. Represented upon walls, you must use for all these purposes combinations and modifications in primary colors of mathematical figures which are susceptible of proof and demonstration. This is the new discovery. This is fact. This is taste. The girl curtsied and sat down. She was very young, and she looked as if she were frightened by the matter-of-fact prospect the world afforded. An excerpt from *Hard Times* by Charles Dickens, featuring Janice Duclos, Morrow Hantman, and William Dom Keller, all members of Trinity Rep's resident company, and you're listening to the Trinity Rep Radio Theater here on WRNI. I'm Bob C, along with artistic director Kurt Columbus. And Kurt, how much of that was taken from Dickens' own experience? Well, quite a lot of it, Bob. You know, Dickens uh, was, uh, as a child. Um, forced into labor, and um, he didn't have a very positive experience with education from the time <laughs> that he was a young man. And then a lot of this also came from later in adulthood. He went on visits to schools around the country and saw exactly how the education worked at the time. And it was、um, the education system was uh, uh, well, it, it was not very good, as we can hear. And it resonates a bit with today's. It does. It absolutely、sure. does. Next,、uh, we're going to hear another excerpt from *Hard Times*, and yes,、uh, Janice,、did. tell us about that. In this, we're going to meet Mrs. Gradgrind, and we're going to meet Mr. Gradgrind's good friend, and we're going to hear his reflections on childhood and education. We'll hear Maro Hantman, Annie Scaria, and Bill Domkaler reading *Mr. Bounderby* from *Hard Times*. Mr. Bounderby was as near being Mr. Gradgrind's bosom friend. As a man perfectly devoid of sentiment can approach that spiritual relationship towards another man perfectly devoid of sentiment, so near was Mr. Bounderby, or, if the reader prefer it, so far off. He was a rich man, banker, merchant, manufacturer, and what not. A big, loud man with a stare and a metallic laugh. A man made out of a coarse material, which seemed to have been stretched to make so much of him. A man with a great puffed head and forehead, swelled veins in his temples, and such a strained skin to his face that it seemed to hold his eyes open and lift his eyebrows up. A man with a pervading appearance on him of being inflated like a balloon and ready to start. A man who could never sufficiently vaunt himself a self-made man. A man who was the bully of humility. A year or two younger than his eminently practical friend, Mr. Bounderby looked older. His seven or eight and forty might have had seven or eight added to it again without surprising anybody. He had not much hair; one might have fancied he had talked it off, and that what was left, all standing up in disorder, was in that condition from being constantly blown about by his windy boastfulness. In the formal drawing room of Stone Lodge, standing on the hearth rug. Warming himself before the fire, 
Mr. Bounderby delivered some observations to Mrs. Gradgrind on the circumstance of its being his birthday. He stood before the fire, partly because it was a cool spring afternoon, though the sun shone, partly because the shade of Stone Lodge was always haunted by the ghost of damp mortar, partly because he thus took up a commanding position from which to subdue Mrs. Gradgrind. I hadn't a shoe to my foot. As to a stocking, I didn't know such a thing by name. I passed the day in a ditch and the night in a pigsty. That's the way I spent my tenth birthday. Not that a ditch was new to me, for I was born in a ditch. Mrs. Gradgrind, a little, thin, white, pink-eyed bundle of shawls, of surpassing feebleness, mental and bodily, who was always physic without any effect, and who, whenever she showed a symptom of coming to life, was invariably stunned by some weighty piece of fact tumbling on her. Mrs. Gradgrind hoped it was a dry ditch. No! As wet as a sop! A foot of water in it. Enough to give a baby cold. Oh, cold! <laughs> I was born with inflammation of the lungs, and of everything else, I believe, that was capable of inflammation. For years, ma'am, I was one of the most miserable little wretches ever seen. I was so sickly that I was always moaning and groaning. I was so ragged and dirty that you wouldn't have touched me with a pair of tongs. Mrs. Gradgrind faintly looked at the tongs as the most appropriate thing her imbecility could think of doing. How I fought through it, I don't know. I was determined, I suppose. I have been a determined character in later life, and I suppose I was then. Here I was, Mrs. Gradgrind, anyhow, and nobody to thank for my being here but myself. Mrs. Gradgrind meekly and weakly hoped that his mother... My mother! Bolted, ma'am. Mrs. Gradgrind, stunned as usual, collapsed and gave it up. My mother left me to my grandmother, and according to the best of my remembrance, my grandmother was the wickedest, worst old woman that ever lived. If I got a, a little pair of shoes by any chance, she would take them off and sell them for drink. Why, I have known that grandmother of mine lie in her bed and drink her fourteen glasses of liquor before breakfast. Mrs. Gradgrind, weakly smiling and giving no other sign of vitality, looked, as she always did, like an indifferently executed transparency of a small female figure without enough light behind it. She kept a chandler's shop and kept me in an egg box. <laughs> that was the cot of my infancy, an old egg box. As soon as I was big enough to run away, of course I ran away. Then I became a young vagabond. And instead of one old woman knocking me about and starving me, everybody of all ages knocked me about and starved me. Well, they were right. They had no business to do anything else. I was a nuisance, an encumbrance, and a pest. I know that very well. His pride in having at any time of life achieved such a great social distinction as to be a nuisance, an encumbrance, and a pest was only to be satisfied by three sonorous repetitions of the boast. I was to pull through it, I suppose, Mrs. Gradgrind. Whether I was to do it or not, ma'am, I did it. I pulled through it, though nobody threw me out a rope. Vagabond, errand boy, vagabond. Laborer, porter, clerk, chief manager, small partner... Josiah Bounderby of Coketown. <laughs> Those are the antecedents and the culmination. Josiah Bounderby of Coketown learned his letters from the outsides of the shops, Mrs. Gradgrind, and was first able to tell the time upon a dial plate from studying the steeple clock at St. Giles. St. Giles Church, London, under the direction of a drunken cripple who was a convicted thief and incorrigible vagrant Tell Josiah Bounderby of Coketown of your district schools and your model schools, your training schools, your whole kettle of fish schools. And Josiah Bounderby of Coketown tells you plainly, all right, all correct, he hadn't such advantages, but let us have hard-headed, solid-fisted people. The education that made him won't do for everybody he knows well. Such and such his education was. However, you may force him to swallow boiling fat... 
but you shall never force him to suppress the facts of his life. Being heated when he arrived at this climax, Josiah Bounderby of Coketown stopped. The work of Charles Dickens, an excerpt of Hard Times, featuring Morrow Hetman, Annie Scaria, and Bill Domkeller. And you're listening to Trinity Rep Radio Theater here on WRNI. Annie, let me ask you, what does it take for an actor to bring these kinds of characters to life from the page? Playing Dickens is such a joy because he writes in these fabulously dramatic broad strokes from the names of his characters to the descriptions of his characters. He gives an actor so much to play with and to go on that it's just, it's really fun. Is it completely different as an actor preparing a reading of Dickens' fiction than preparing one of his roles for a stage production? Well, um, in a reading of his fiction where... You have uh, you are reading so much of his description, mm-hmm. and um, because he got paid by the word, I imagine, and because <laughs> he's such a fabulous writer, his descriptions are so wonderful, and he manages to get the author's voice, his voice, and a part of the character into the very descriptions themselves, which is different than when you're reading something that is adapted for the theater like A Christmas Carol. But the thing that they have in common also is just this extraordinary depth of understanding that Dickens has of the human nature, Mm -hmm. the human um, and and stage character or a reading from fiction. I think that we we instinctively understand the kind of human being that he is describing and uh, and shaping in front of us. Mm -hmm. Um, uh, We have to do that vocally when we do a reading and the challenge as a to put that on the stage is of course to make it f- more physical uh to to take those descriptions that uh he got paid so much for right <laughs> <laughs> into well, the body and he's you know what's interesting too bill is because he does create uh what we might call caricatures but when you see them enacted what you what you find is that there's a depth a texture um, to the people themselves that might be lost in just uh, in, in just thinking about the words, you know. So, in flesh, Dickens takes on a kind of well, I mean, complexity. Yeah, I, I, so the characters that he's created uh, live in this world. I mean, they Oliver do. Twist, we all and, know them, yeah, yeah. and some of <laughs> them are us. Shrewd, you know? <laughs> <laughs> well, I mean, and you look at Bounder, Mr. Bounderby, uh, and and at first you think, well, this guy's he's he's a sketch, right? And yet, the deeper you go into him, he's our fathers and uncles, and, you know, we've known men like him, all of us. He reminds me of the character from Saturday Night Live, you know, the old man who used to say, well, you know, we walked to school 50 miles, and we liked it. (laughs) Right. That was my dad. (laughs) That was your dad. Mine, too. Mine, too, actually. Tell us about the uh, next selection, which is from the posthumous papers of the Pickwick Club. Well, this is a little bit of romance we'll throw in here. Um, Just before the Pickwick Papers was published, there's some peas for you, uh, he was married, (laughs) and the Pickwick Papers became his first real literary success at the age of 25. Well, let's hear it then. An excerpt from the Pickwick Papers, Mr. Tupman and the Spinster Aunt, with Bill Domkeller, Janice Duclos, and Mara Hentman. It was evening... Isabella and Emily had strolled out with Mr. Trundle. The deaf old lady had fallen asleep in her chair. The snoring of the fat boy penetrated in a low and monotonous sound from the distant kitchen. The buxom servants were lounging at the side door, enjoying the pleasantness of the hour, and the delights of a flirtation on first principles with certain unwieldy animals attached to the farm. And there sat the interesting pair, uncared for by all, caring for none, and dreaming only of themselves. There they sat, in short, like a pair of carefully folded kid gloves, bound up in each other. "'I have forgotten my flowers,' said the spinster aunt. "'What of them now?' said Mr. Tupman, in accents of persuasion." You will take cold in the evening air. No, no, it will do me good. Let me accompany you. The lady paused to adjust the sling in which the left arm of the youth was placed, and taking his right arm led him to the garden. There was a bower at the further end with 
honeysuckle, jessamine, and creeping plants, one of those sweet retreats which humane men erect for the accommodation of spiders. The spinster aunt took up a large watering pot which lay in one corner, and was about to leave the arbor. Mr. Tupman detained her, drew her to a seat beside him. Miss Wardle. The spinster aunt trembled, still, till some pebbles which had accidentally found their way into the large watering pot shook like an infant's rattle. Miss Wardle, you are an angel. <gasps> Mr. Tupman. Rachel blushed as red as the watering pot itself. Nay, I know it but too well. All women are angels, they say. Then what can you be? Or to what, without presumption, can I compare you? Where was the woman ever seen who resembled you? Where else could I hope to find so rare a combination of excellence and beauty? Where else could I seek to... Oh! Here, Mr. Tupman paused and pressed the hand which clasped the handle of the happy watering pot. The lady turned aside her head. Men are such deceivers. They are, they are, ejaculated Mr. Tupman. But not all men. There lives at least one being who can never change, one being who would be content to devote his whole existence to your happiness, who lives but in your eyes, who breathes but in your smiles, who bears the heavy burden of life itself only for you. Could such an individual be found? But he can be found. He is found. He is here, Miss Wardle. And ere the lady was aware of his intention, Mr. Tupman had sunk upon his knees at her feet. Mr. Tupman, rise! Never! Was the valorous reply. He seized her passive hand, and the watering pot fell to the ground as he pressed it to his lips. Oh, Rachel, say you love me. With averted head, the spinster aunt whispered, Mr. Tupman. I can hardly speak the words, but, but, you are not wholly indifferent to me. Mr. Tupman no sooner heard this avowal than he proceeded to do what his enthusiastic emotions prompted, and what, for aught we know, for we are but little acquainted with such matters, people so circumstanced always do. He jumped up and throwing his arm around the neck of the spinster aunt, imprinted upon her lips numerous kisses, which after a due show of struggling and resistance, she received so passively that there is no telling how many more Mr. Tupman might have bestowed if the lady had not given a very unaffected start, and exclaimed in an affrighted tone, <gasps> Mr. Tupman, we are observed! We are discovered! Mr. Tupman looked around. There was the fat boy perfectly motionless, with his large, circular eyes staring into the arbor, but without the slightest expression on his face that the most expert physiognomist could have referred to as astonishment, curiosity, or any other known passion that agitates the human breast. Mr. Tupman gazed on the fat boy, and the fat boy stared at him, and the longer Mr. Tupman observed the utter vacancy of the fat boy's countenance, the more convinced he became that he either did not know or did not understand anything that had been going forward. Under this impression, he said with great firmness, What do you want here, sir? Supper's ready, sir, was the prompt reply. Have you just come here, sir? Just, replied the fat boy. Mr. Tupman looked at him very hard, but there was not a wink in his eye or a curve in his face. Mr. Tupman took the arm of the spinster aunt and walked towards the house. The fat boy followed behind. He knows nothing of what has happened. <sighs> nothing. There was a sound behind them, as of an imperfectly suppressed chuckle. Mr. Tupman turned sharply around. No. It could not have been the fat boy. There was not a gleam of mirth or anything but feeding in his whole visage. That was Bill Domkeller, Jadis Duclos, and Marl Hantman with an excerpt from the Pickwick Papers on Trinity Rep Radio Theater. Uh, <laughs> what about Charles Dickens' incredible sense of humor? Oh, it's hard not to laugh when it you're is. doing this. It's really, I mean, and, and the sense of humor is 
always melded with this kind of social criticism in such a way that um, you get what he's trying to say about the 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 way in which the social mores are a constriction and they're dumb and and yet at the same time I, I mean it's just the construction is so exquisite and hilarious right yeah. And it's one of the things that made Pickwick Papers so popular, too, I imagine. Was this. It's just the title alone gets me, the posthumous papers of the Pickwick <laughs> Club. Peter Piper picked the peck of pickled peppers. Right. I mean, you can't, you, you can't hear that sound without understanding that there's something funny that's going to happen. It was wildly popular, and, and the way they measured part of its popularity was the fact that so many people were naming their pets after characters in the papers. <laughs> That's when you know you have arrived. So yes. Thank you, Jeff. Yes. yes. Good thing they didn't start naming their children after him. Yeah. He's, it, it's interesting. Uh, around this time, Bob, um, Dickens decided that he was going to uh, make a trip to America. So he's, he's wildly popular and beginning to have popularity here in America. And he comes to America, writes a book called American Notes in 1842. And while he's here... Um, he observes some things that he will write about. Um, we're going to read a letter, actually, next. Um, he's writing to his friend, John Forster, who later became a biographer, um, on the subject of slavery. And it's very interesting to hear his unvarnished opinion in this piece. Bill Dom Keller will read Charles Dickens' 1842 letter on slavery. At Washington again, Monday, March the 21st, 1842. Richmond is a prettily situated town, but like other towns in slave districts, as the planters themselves admit, has an aspect of decay and gloom which to an unaccustomed eye is most distressing. In the black car, for they don't let them sit with the whites, on the railroad, as we went there, were a mother and family whom the steamer was conveying away to sell, retaining the man the husband and father, I mean, on the plantation. The children cried the whole way. Yesterday, on board the boat, a slave owner and two constables were our fellow passengers. They were coming here in search of two Negroes who had run away on the previous day. On the bridge at Richmond, there is a notice against fast driving over it, as it is rotten and crazy. Penalty? For whites, five dollars. For slaves, fifteen stripes. My heart is lightened, as if a great load has been taken from it, when I think that we are turning our backs on this accursed and detested system. I really don't think I could have borne it any longer. That's all very well to say. Be silent on the subject. Well, they won't let you be silent. They, they will ask you what you think of it, and will expatiate on slavery as if it were one of the greatest blessings of mankind. It's not, said a hard, bad-looking fellow to me the other day, it's not the interest of a man to use his slaves ill. It's damned nonsense that you hear in England. I, I told him quietly that it was not a man's interest to get drunk, or to steal, or to game, or to indulge in any other vice, but he did indulge in it for all that. That cruelty and the abuse of irresponsible power were two of the bad passions of human nature, and the gratifications of which considerations of interest or of ruin had nothing whatever to do and that while every candid man must admit that even slave might be happy enough with a good master, all human beings knew that bad masters, cruel masters, and masters who disgraced the form they bore were matters of experience and history, whose existence was as undisputed as that of slaves themselves. Well, he was a little taken aback by this and asked me if I believed in the Bible. Yes, I said, but if any man could prove to me that it sanctioned slavery, I would place no further credence in it. Well, then, he said, by God, sir, the niggers must be kept down, and the whites have put down the colored people wherever they have found them. That's the whole question, said I. 
Charles Dickens, 1842 Letter on Slavery, read by Bill Dom Keller. What was the reaction uh, to this in this country? Well, as as one Turn. might imagine, <laughs> uh, the reaction was uh, one of shock and outrage. And um, uh, Dickens saw a, a fall off in the popularity of his work. And so for the, the second edition of American Notes... He wrote a preface, which we'd also like to read now, just so we can get a sense for um, how, how he makes an apology. My readers have opportunities of judging for themselves whether the influences and tendencies which I distrusted in America had, at that time, any existence but in my imagination. They can examine for themselves whether there has been anything in the public career of that country since at home or abroad, which suggests that those influences and tendencies really did exist. As they find the fact, they will judge me. If they discern any evidences of wrong-going in any direction that I have indicated, they will acknowledge that I had reason in what I wrote. If they discern no such indications, they will consider me altogether mistaken, but not fully prejudiced I am not, and never have been, otherwise than in favor of the United States. I have many friends in America. I feel a grateful interest in the country. I hope and believe it will successfully work out a problem of the highest importance to the whole human race. To represent me as viewing America with ill nature, coldness, or animosity is merely to do a very foolish thing, which is always a very easy one. That was uh, William Domkeller reading the preface to the second edition of American Notes. And uh, let me ask you, Kurt, uh, how much of an apology was that? (laughs) Uh, I don't see it as much of an apology at all. I mean, if this is his apologia, uh, you'd hate to get his full-blown criticism, (laughs) I think. Um, I, it's uh, fascinating to to hear um, these words spoken out loud. Uh, and when Bill was reading this the other day in rehearsal, he he had he he f- had an observation that they have a resonance today. Well, yeah, I mean, in his his final paragraph uh, when he he uh, states that he believes that America has a um, an almost moral obligation, especially at that time, to work out that huge problem of uh, slavery. Uh, and and then goes on to say that if you attack me for criticizing uh, American policy, this is a very, very easy thing to do. And I just thought how prescient that is in, in terms of what... Uh, you know, the the political atmosphere that we're facing today, where, you know, to to speak out against something that is of uh, moral ambiguity, perhaps, uh, could be labeled as unpatriotic. And uh, and uh, I think uh, Dickens' words today are just, they just resonated for me when I had the opportunity to speak them aloud like that. It's a, 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 a fascinating that the construction of the words themselves gives us such an understanding of the man. You know, the way in which he spoke is really revelatory about uh, the way in which he wrote, obviously, uh, but but I, I imagine the way in which he spoke, because he often toured and did readings of all of his work, Bob. I mean, he was here in the United States um, and and in Boston quite often, and he, he was always reading his work aloud. It's work that asks to be read aloud, in a sense. We're listening to the work of Charles Dickens here on the Trinity Rep Radio Theater, and uh, I believe Annie Scaria, do you have a comment about uh, his social and political views that he expresses? Yeah, I was just going to say that that it's really in his fiction where his social consciousness is so apparent because he constructs it with huge um, extremes, and so you can really see it. His letter, his you know, his personal papers, his personal writings are certainly. Um, clear about where he stands, but in his fiction, he leaves no doubt. <laughs> Annie Scaria and uh, Janice Duclos, uh, the next piece we're going to hear is a good example of that, isn't it? Yes, I think it is. It's a scene from Bleak House. <laughs> 
and um, we'll be hearing from the narrator whose name is Esther. She's an orphan whose parentage is unknown to her at this point in the story. She's been taken in by Mr. Jarndyce to be a companion to his ward, Ada. And in this scene, she and Ada accompany one Mrs. Pardiggle to the brickmakers on her charitable rounds. So now we'll hear Mrs. Pardiggle visits the brickmakers, performed by Annie Scaria and Morrow Hantman. I was glad when we came to the brickmaker's house, though it was one of a cluster of wretched hovels in a brick field, with pigsties close to the broken windows, and miserable little gardens before the doors, growing nothing but stagnant pools. Here and there an old tub was put to catch the droppings of rainwater from a roof, or they were banked up with mud into a little pond like a large dirt pie. At the doors and windows some men and women lounged or prowled about, and took little notice of us, except to laugh to one another, or to say something as we passed, about gentlefolks minding their own business, and not troubling their heads and muddying their shoes with coming to look after other people's. Mrs. Pardiggle, leading the way with a great show of moral determination, and talking with much volubility about the untidy habits of the people, though I doubted if the best of us could have been tidy in such a place, conducted us into a cottage at the furthest corner, the ground-floor room of which we nearly filled. Besides ourselves, there were in this damp, offensive room a woman with a black eye, nursing a poor little gasping baby by the fire, a man all stained with clay and mud and looking very dissipated, lying at full length on the ground, smoking a pipe, a powerful young man fastening a collar on a dog, and a bold girl doing some kind of washing in very dirty water. They all looked up at us as we came in, and the woman seemed to turn her face towards the fire as if to hide her bruised eye. Nobody gave us any welcome. "'Well, my friends,' said Mrs. Pardiggle. But her voice had not a friendly sound, I thought, and it was much too businesslike and systematic. "'How do you do, all of you? I am here again. I told you you couldn't tire me, you know. I am fond of hard work and am true to my word.' The man on the floor, whose head rested on his hand as he stared at us, growled, "'There ain't any more on you to come in, is there?' "'No, my friend,' said Mrs. Pardiggle, seating herself on one stool and knocking down another. "'We are all here.' "'Because I thought there weren't enough of you, perhaps.' The young man and the girl both laughed. Two friends of the young man whom we had attracted to the doorway and who stood there with their hands in their pockets echoed the laugh noisily. "'You can't tire me, good people,' said Mrs. Pardiggle to these latter. I enjoy hard work, and the harder you make mine, the better I like it. Then make it easy for her. I want it done and over. I want the end of these liberties took with my place. I want the end of being drawed like a badger. Now you're going to pull, pry, and question according to custom. I know what you're going to be up to. Well, you haven't got no occasion to be up to it. I'll save you the trouble. Is my daughter a washin'? Yes, she is a washin'. Look at the water. Smell it. That's what we drinks. How do you like it, and what do you think of gin instead? Ain't my place dirty? Yes, it is dirty. It's naturally dirty, and it's naturally unwholesome. And we've had five dirty and unwholesome children, as is all dead infants, and so much the better for them and for us besides. Have I read the little book what you left? No, I ain't read the little book what you left. There ain't nobody here as knows how to read it. And if there was, it wouldn't be suitable to me. It's a book fit for a babby, and I'm not a babby. If you was to leave me a doll, I shouldn't nurse it. How have I been conducting of myself? Why, I've been drunk for three days, and I'd have been drunk four if I'd had the money. Don't I never mean for to go to church? No, I don't never mean for to go to church. I shouldn't be expected there if I did. The beetle's too genteel for me. And how did my wife get that black eye? Why, I give it her. And if she says I didn't, she's a lie. He had pulled his pipe out of his mouth to say all this, and he now turned over on his other side and smoked again. Mrs. Pardiggle, who had been regarding him through her spectacles with a forcible composure, calculated, I could not help thinking, to increase his antagonism, 
pulled out a good book as if it were a constable's staff and took the whole family into custody. I mean into religious custody, of course. But she really did it, as if she were an inexorable moral policeman carrying them all off to a station house. Ada and I were very uncomfortable. We both felt intrusive and out of place, and we both thought that Mrs. Pardiggle would have got on infinitely better if she had not had such a mechanical way of taking possession of people. The children sulked and stared. The family took no notice of us whatever, except when the young man made the dog bark, which he usually did when Mrs. Pardiggle was most emphatic. We both felt painfully sensible that between us and these people there was an iron barrier which could not be removed by our new friend. By who or how it could be removed, we did not know, but we knew that. Even what she read and said seemed to us to be ill-chosen for such auditors. If it had been imparted ever so modestly and with ever so much tact. As to the little book which the man on the floor had referred, we acquired a knowledge of it afterwards, and Mr. Jarndyce said he doubted if Robinson Crusoe could have read it, though he had had no other on his desolate island. We were much relieved under these circumstances when Mrs. Pardigal left off. The man on the floor then turned his head around again. Well, you've done, have you? For today I have, my friend. But I am never fatigued. I shall come to you again in your regular order, returned Mrs. Pardigal with demonstrative cheerfulness. So long as you goes now, you may do what you like. Mrs. Pardigal accordingly rose and made a little vortex in the confined room from which the pipe itself very narrowly escaped. Taking one of her young family in each hand and telling the others to follow closely and expressing her hope that the brickmaker and all his house would be improved when she saw them next, she then proceeded to another cottage. I hope it is not unkind in me to say that she certainly did make, in this as in everything else, a show that was not conciliatory, of doing charity by wholesale, and of dealing in it to a large extent. She supposed that we were following her. But as soon as the space was left clear, we approached the woman sitting by the fire to ask if the baby were ill. She only looked at it as it lay on her lap. We had observed before that when she looked at it, she covered her discolored eye with her hand, as though she wished to separate any association with noise and violence and ill-treatment from the poor child. Ada, whose gentle heart was moved by its appearance, bent down to touch its little face. As she did so... I saw what happened and drew her back. The little child died. Oh, Esther, cried Ada, sinking on her knees beside it. Look here, oh, Esther, my love, the little thing. The suffering, quiet, pretty little thing. I am so sorry for it. I am so sorry for the mother. I never saw a sight so pitiful as this before. Oh, baby, baby. Ada was so full of grief all the way home. And Richard whom we found at home, was so distressed to see her in tears, though he said to me when she was not present how beautiful it was, too, that we arranged to return at night with some little comforts and repeat our visit at the brickmaker's house. Charles Dickens, Bleak House, in an excerpt performed by Annie Scaria and Mauro Hantman, here on Trinity Rep Radio Theater on WRNI. Mauro, it's uh, easy to see what Dickens thought of uh, Mrs. Pardiggle. He, yeah, he has a a strong sense of uh, you can always tell who the good guys and the bad guys are. <laughs> <laughs> it's so funny because it's it's such a human uh, horror. I mean, right. a description of a abject horror, and yet he finds a way of of showing us the beating heart at the same time, and 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 keeping a sense of humor. Yes, and I like the way he takes the do-gooders to task, because what they're really doing is self-aggrandizing, when what what they sh what they should be doing is bringing relief to the poor and listening and yeah. caring. And listening, and they're, yes, they're, they're only they... interested in telling. Yeah, there's exactly. a that's one thing that the do-gooders today don't behave that way. <laughs> <laughs> it's funny that in, it, the do-gooders always seem to know exactly what to do, you know, in in this and and. Uh, 
And in the first one that we read, Mr. Gradgrind, you know, they always have a, they know exactly the right mm-hmm. way to deal with the situation. There's no questions in their mind. It's, and, in uh, a, it's always the wrong thing to do, of course. In a lot of ways, it's, it's reflective of the Victorian era and the Victorian society and this notion that, that there was a, <laughs> there were facts, there were, there were uh, definitive ways of doing things. And Dickens is the quintessential Victorian writer. And in fact, I, I think we're going to read one more selection. Mm-hmm. That's right. Um, and, uh, which, which which really exemplifies his critique of his age. And that's Kurt Columbus. Uh, Janice Duclos, do you want to tell us a little bit about this? Well, I I think Kurt pretty much said it all. Uh, We're going to hear about a real Victorian. His name is Mr. Podsnap. (laughs) Podsnappery from Our Mutual Friend, performed by Bill Dom Keller and Ennis Scaria. Mr. Podsnap was well-to-do and stood very high in Mr. Podsnap's opinion. Beginning with a good inheritance, he had married a good inheritance and had thriven exceedingly in the marine insurance way and was quite satisfied. He never could make out why everybody was not quite satisfied, and he felt conscious that he set a brilliant social example in being particularly well satisfied with most things, and above all other things with himself. Thus happily acquainted with his own merit and importance, Mr. Podsnap settled that whatever he put behind him, he put out of existence. There was a dignified conclusiveness, not to add a grand convenience in this way of getting rid of disagreeables, which had done much towards establishing Mr. Podsnap in his lofty place in Mr. Podsnap's satisfaction. I don't want to know about it. I don't choose to discuss it. I don't admit it. Mr. Podsnap had even acquired a peculiar flourish of his right arm in often clearing the world of its most difficult problems by sweeping them behind him and consequently sheer away with those words and a flushed face, for they affronted him. Mr. Podsnap's world was not a very large world, morally. No, nor even geographically. Seeing that although his business was sustained upon commerce with other countries, He considered other countries, with that important reservation, a mistake, and of their manners and customs would conclusively observe... Not English! When presto! With a flourish of the arm and a flush of the face, they were swept away. Elsewise, the world got up at eight, shaved close at a quarter past, breakfasted at nine, went to the city at ten, came home at half past five, and dined at seven. Mr. Podsnap's notion of the arts, in their integrity, might have been stated thus. Literature. Large print, respectively descriptive of getting up at eight, shaving close at a quarter past, breakfasting at nine, going to the city at ten, coming home at half past five, and dining at seven. Painting and sculpture. Models and portraits representing professors of getting up at eight, Shaving clothes at a quarter past, breakfasting at nine, going to the city at ten, coming home at half past five, and dining at seven. Music, a respectable performance without variations on stringed and wind instruments, sedately expressive of getting up at eight, shaving clothes at a quarter past, breakfasting at nine, going to the city at ten, coming home at half past five, and dining at seven. Nothing else to be permitted to those same vagrants of the arts on pain of excommunication. Nothing else to be anywhere. As a so eminently respectable man, Mr. Podsnap was quite sensible of its being required of him to take providence under his protection. Consequently, he always knew exactly what providence meant. Inferior and less respectable men might fall short of that mark, but Mr. Podsnap was always up to it, and it was very remarkable, and must have been very comfortable, that what Providence meant was invariably what Mr. Podsnap meant. These may be said to have been the articles of a faith and school which the present chapter takes the liberty of calling after its representative man, Podsnappery. They were confined within close bounds, as Mr. Podsnap's own head was confined by his shirt collar, and they were enunciated with a sounding pomp that smacked of the creaking of Mr. Podsnap's own boots. There was a Miss Podsnap, and this young rocking horse was being trained in her mother's art of prancing in a stately manner without ever getting on. (laughs) 
but the high parental action was not yet imparted to her, and in truth she was but an undersized damsel, with high shoulders, low spirits, chilled elbows, and a rasped surface of a nose, who seemed to take occasional frosty peeps out of childhood into womanhood, and to shrink back again, overcome by her mother's headdress and her father from head to foot, crushed by the mere dead weight of Podsnappery. The Podsnaps lived in a shady angle adjoining Portman Square. They were a kind of people certain to dwell in the shade wherever they dwelt. Miss Podsnap's life had been, from her first appearance on this planet, altogether of a shady order. For Mr. Podsnap's young person was likely to get little good out of association with other young persons, and had therefore been restricted to companionship with not very congenial older persons, and with massive furniture. Said Mr. Podsnap to Mrs. Podsnap, "'Georgiana is almost eighteen. Said Mrs. Podsnap to Mr. Podsnap, assenting, "'Almost eighteen. Said Mr. Podsnap then to Mrs. Podsnap, "'Really, I think we should have some people on Georgiana's birthday.' Said Mrs. Podsnap then to Mr. Podsnap, "'Which will enable us to clear off all those people who are due.' So it came to pass that Mr. and Mrs. Podsnap requested the honour of the company of seventeen friends of their souls at dinner, and that they substituted other friends of their souls for such of the seventeen original friends of their souls as deeply regretted that a prior engagement prevented their having the honour of dining with Mr. and Mrs. Podsnap in pursuance of their kind invitation. Mrs. Podsnap said of all these inconsolable personages, as she checked them off with a pencil in her list, asked, at any rate, and got rid of. They successfully disposed of a good many friends of their souls in this way, and felt their consciences much lightened. <laughs> An excerpt from Our Mutual Friend by Charles Dickens, featuring Annie Scaria and Bill Domkaler here on Trinity Rep Radio Theater. And Kurt Columbus, uh, that certainly is a... A skewering of the Victorian <laughs> worldview, isn't it? It is. I, you know, in, in as with all of these characters, you end up loving them for their foibles. I, I mean, I, I just can't listen to this particular section without being in love with Mr. and Mrs. Podstep. <laughs> they're, they're horrifying people, but you love them as well. But I, you know, when I think about them being a subscriber. <laughs> to the theater, and I hear about how they only want to see and hear anything that reflects their own lives. It and must that's look it. like me. <laughs> it's a nightmare. Fortunately, we, we, we don't have subscribers like that's that. Right. No. No. Well, I want to thank you all for this uh, very entertaining an enlightening uh, w look at the work of Charles Dickens that a lot of people may not know. But uh, next month, we're going to have a part two of Charles Dickens, and it probably will be a lot more familiar to people, won't it, Kurt? We'll have a little bit more of a holiday flair. Holidays? Holidays coming? <laughs> <laughs> well, thank you all. Trinity Rep Radio Theater is a production of Trinity Repertory Company in association with WRNI Radio. Producers are Emily Atkinson and Janice Duclos. Our studio producer is Mark Degon. Performers included William Dom Kaler, Mauro Hantman, Annie Scaria, and Janice Duclos. The executive producers of Trinity Rep Radio Theater are WRNI General Manager Joe O'Connor and Trinity Rep Artistic Director Kurt Columbus. I'm Bob C., and join us next month for another Trinity Rep Radio Theater.